All right, so serve your church. What what we really wanted to do was uh, a lot of stuff goes on on a week to week basis to keep uh, just the organization and stuff like worship gatherings, community groups, discipleship groups, all that kind of stuff, financial stuff. Um, a lot happens every week, and we have a we're finally to the point where it's like okay, let's start really organizing because we want more people to be able to come and get plugged in and to effectively reach the lost and disciple the saved, we need to all pitch in and do our part. And I think that's pretty obvious and clear to everybody that we need to do that. So uh, we spent some time laying out everything that goes on and everything that we've kind of dreamed that we would like to go on. And we've laid it out and we're just going to go through some of that tonight, talk about it. And I want you to just be paying attention tonight to the things that we talk about that are needed. Look for the things that you feel like you're gifted in, like your personality. Um, some of you are better organizers than other. Some of you are better at just like, hey, I'll do whatever and I'll do it well. I just need someone to kind of tell me what to do. And so that's cool. If you're an organizer, I'm kind of, I'm that way. I know Adrian's that way that like we're good at being in charge and organizing type stuff, delegating. I know Brittany's gifted in that too. And some of the other guys may, may feel like that as well. And those are just some people I know that we kind of same share the same personalities. Um, so just be paying attention to to that kind of stuff, your personalities, but also the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you, whether it's encouragement, whether it's uh, just service, whether it's giving, whether it's organizing, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I want to go through a few verses in the Word before we get going in any of this other stuff, because I want to be clear why we're doing what we're doing. And so if you got a Bible or if you just want to read with me on screen, 1 Peter 4.18. First, sorry, yeah, 1 Peter 4. 18, whoa. Um, 8 through 11 is actually... Huh? Well, it's all right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to actually read it from here so we have the right thing, no matter what. So, I was really organized as far as that. <laughs> right? Double-checking everything. Brag. I didn't think I was doing that. Where are you? <coughs> Alright, it's chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. So, this is what the Word, this is what the word says. The P- Peter's writing to the churches, a bunch of churches, that he is like an apostle, he is an overseer over a bunch of different church plants all over. And he says this, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So this is the word. This is what I want us to focus on, that everything that we've all been given gifts of God's varied grace, as the word says, (coughs) and we're to use them in such a way that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And this is what we try to focus on in everything at Ecclesia, that everything we do is done for a reason and is done with the mindset of glorifying God, of making much of God through Christ, through the gospel. So... No matter what we're doing, we want it to be all about Jesus. And a lot of that has to do with the mindset of why we're doing what we're doing and remembering this is all about Jesus, this is all about glorifying Jesus, even in the small stuff that happens and that we serve in. It's really all about Jesus. It's so more people can be discipled, more people can be reached, and we can effectively um, make sure that people don't get burnt out in different areas of ministry. A big problem with a lot of churches is that pastors try to heap so much on themselves and do so much work themselves that they get so burnt out that they don't even have time for prayer and really Bible study. The only time they have for that kind of stuff is they're praying or they're trying to study the Bible to prepare to preach again. And so that's something that we never want to happen. And we want anyone and everyone who is serving um, to not have this crazy burden on them that they're getting burnt out and that it's becoming a job and not a joy to serve in the church. So uh, first, that's First Peter 4. 8 through 11. Also, go with me to Acts chapter 6. This is the beginning, I I firmly believe, of of deacons in the local churches. 
So what's been happening is the, the local church just started. The Holy Spirit fell. Uh, 3,000 people were saved the very first day. Um, Christianity essentially starts with Peter preaching this huge sermon. Jesus lived, died, resurrected, and he went, he arose to heaven. And then right after that, he sends the Holy Spirit, and they, he falls on all of the believers. There are about 120. And then some of the men go out and start proclaiming the gospel to everybody. And 3,000 people that day came to Christ and were baptized, received the Holy Spirit. And so they had pretty much had a mega church day one. And so there's 12 apostles at this time. 12, these would be the pastors of the early church. And they're trying to shepherd effectively 3,000 people. So this doesn't work very well. So you don't get very far until some of this stuff starts coming up. But um, this is what I believe is the birth of deacons in the church. The word deacon means servant. And it essentially in the scripture, we're not given um, a lot of things that it says this is exactly what deacons do, but we're given the ideas of what a deacon does. So right here. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Hellenist just means a Greek speaking Jew. It's a Jew. The Hebrews are Jews. Hebrews speak Hebrew. Hellenists speak Greek. So anyways, they're all Christians. They speak different languages, though. There, uh, an argument arose or a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because the widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve, this is the apostles, the pastors of, of this early church, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So what they're saying here is not that um, we're too good and we're too cool to be doing this kind of service work. They're saying there's so much work going on here and we're trying to make sure that everyone's taken care of, that we need help, and it's not right that we should try to do a million things on our own. That's basically what's happening. They're not saying it's a stupid and a lowly position to be a deacon and to serve, but they're saying we've got to figure out a way to all work together so that we can have time for prayer and to study the word and administer the word as pastors are first and foremost called to do. So, therefore, brothers, they continue, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So these guys are chosen. This is nothing to lead us to believe that there are only supposed to be seven deacons in a church. This is just the amount that they needed right then to do this. So we see deacons are appointed all throughout Scripture in local churches. But these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So really what we see here is that the pastors are overloaded and they appoint deacons to be lead servants in the church. And when they come in, they start leading in these ways to help out and to really increase uh, the ministry to make sure people aren't getting burnt out and that we can focus on the word and prayer, all this kind of stuff. And what you see from that is that the word of God continued to increase and the numbers of the disciples multiplied. It's an interesting word that's used multiplied. It's not just added, but it's everyone is serving in such a way that it's not like a few of the pastors are making disciples and it's just kind of adding to it. Multiplication, multiplication has this view of everyone is making disciples. Everyone's sharing the word. Everyone's pitching in, doing their part in serving. And so disciples start multiplying because everyone's doing their part. So, and something kind of cool at the end, that a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So maybe if we all pitch in effectively and serve and make disciples, religious people will even come to meet Jesus. That the priests who didn't want anything to do with Christianity, they wanted religion, they wanted the Jewish tradition, they even came to be saved. So we all chip in, maybe religious people get saved too. That'd be awesome. So the Word of God continued to increase, all that good stuff. Um, but that's just basically what the Scripture says about deacons. You can go to the book of 1 Timothy sometime and look at the qualifications for deacons. At Ecclesia, we believe that men and women are able to be deacons. Some churches believe that it's only men, 
Um, because I, in my opinion, I think they misunderstand what Paul is saying in 1 Timothy 3. He talks about overseers, which are pastors, and he gives qualifications for that. And then he goes into qualifications for deacons. And the way some people understand it is that he gives qualifications for deacons and then gives qualifications for deacons' wives as well. So pastors are the highest authority, human authority, in the local church. And he speaks, Paul speaks nothing about their wives. He continually says, he, 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 talking about pastors, that it is a male role. That's pretty clear. And he moves on to deacons and starts saying they, 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 they. And then when it gets to the part to where people think that he just starts talking about deacons' wives, the word could actually be translated wives or women. It could be either or. I believe that it's women and that he's talking about qualifications for women deacons. Um, this works pretty well because if, if the wives of the deacons are held to a higher accountability than the overseers' wives that aren't held to any accountability, if that's the case, it doesn't really make sense. Why the overseers' wives, oh, they can do whatever they want. But the deacons' wives, who are the servants of the church, who lead by serving, their wives have to be of this. It doesn't really make sense. And you can read through it if you want, and we can talk through it later if you'd like to. But um, a deacon just means a servant. It means someone who is a lead servant in the local church that's been appointed by the elders, by the pastors of the church, to, to lead out in ministry and to organize and to do different things like that. So we wholeheartedly believe that that we can all be deacons, men and women, if they are qualified and if they meet the qualifications of Scripture, they feel called, and if the pastors feel <clears throat> that they are equipped and called, and then they appoint them. So that's kind of the big idea. It's all about serving. That we're all called to serve our local church and to be a part of our local church and working together, but there are some that are called to lead in their serving, where pastors more lead by their preaching and by the organization and by the overseeing of everything, and the buck stops with pastors. Hebrews 13 says that pastors are going to be held accountable to God for their flock that they've been entrusted with, where deacons more lead by their serving, and by organizing still, and by working alongside the pastors, but by uh, really serving in ministry and leading in that way. So that's it. I want to pray for us before we get into some of the stuff, uh, but I just wanted you to be clear in Scripture why we're doing this, that we're all chipping in, we're all doing our part. And the goal is that we reach more people for Jesus and that we can effectively disciple more people in the gospel. That's all it's about. It's so that people don't get burnt out and so we can reach and serve our city in a better way. So let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for this time. I thank you for every person that has taken time out of their week to come and meet here and to talk about serving in their church that you have given us. I ask you to open our eyes to the positions and the different ways that we've been gifted by you, that you've given us the Holy Spirit to, to work in your church and to make disciples and to reach the lost and to effectively pitch in and to do our part. We thank you for the grace that you've given us, that you've given all of us different gifts and different visions and different personalities to be able to work together as a body, as your church, to serve you, to serve each other, and to serve our city and our world at large. We thank you for everything you've done for us, and most of all for Jesus. Thank you for the gospel. Holy Spirit, be very evident and be at work tonight throughout all of this that we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I want to let you guys know first uh, a little bit what's going on with our preaching schedule. We go this whole, pretty much this whole year until November. Now it's November 18th until we are done with the King and His Cross. So we're still walking through the life of Jesus. And then two weeks in between the King and His Cross and Advent, we, we don't know what's going on there yet. There'll be two Sundays in there. Advent is the time at the end of the year, right before Christmas, that we really study the coming of Christ into the world, how He came 2,000 plus years ago, and then the second coming of Christ when He comes back and the hope that He has promised us that He's coming back for His people. So then we'll have four weeks of Advent, and that's the first four weeks in December. And we have one week, December 30th. We don't know what we're doing there yet. Then January through February, we're going to be going through a series called Jesus and His Church. We're going to focus on what is a local church, who leads in a local church, what the Bible says about all that kind of stuff, what should we be about as a local church. I'm pumped about this because I think a lot of people don't really understand what a local church really is. A lot of us don't have this deep, biblical understanding of what the Bible says about this kind of stuff, about how we are to be on mission, 
about who's supposed to be leading, who's supposed to be serving, who's supposed to be involved, all that kind of stuff. So that's the purpose of that, that we would understand that and we would understand that Jesus is our pastor, he's our good shepherd, and he's leading first and foremost our church. Then from the first week in March until May 5th, we're going to go through our church doctrine week by week, taking these big things about God, who God is, um, what God creates, what God says, the Bible, um, what God requires, talking about the law, what God provides, the gospel, talking about Jesus, all these kind of things. Uh, I think that's around 12 weeks that we're just going to walk through our church doctrine, what the Bible says about these huge issues. Uh, Mark Driscoll wrote a book called Doctrine, and his subtitle was What Christians Should Believe. I thought that was interesting. Maybe a little cocky, but kind of interesting that he said that. But that's essentially what we're going through. This is what the Bible says about these big, big issues, and this is what we should believe because this is what the Bible says about it. I'm excited about those two. We typically try to go through books of the Bible, um, but we think it's important to just kind of hone in on certain subjects here and there. So Jesus and His Church, then Doctrine, and then May 12th through either September or October. We haven't hammered down every week. We're going to go through the entire book of Ephesians. And I'm really excited about that. It's a great book. Um, it's the book in the Bible that says the word church more than any other book. It talks a lot about uh, what Jesus did and what happened before Jesus came and all that. And the grace that was shown to us in Christ. And then the last three chapters show us how that fleshes out after we've properly understood the gospel and how that fleshes out in the church. Then September through October, or September or October through November, we don't know yet. And then December will be an Advent again. So we got a little, a few little things to fill in, and then I'm hoping we're still praying through uh, the entire year of 2014, going through the Acts of the Apostles, going through the Book of Acts, 28 chapters, going verse by verse through it. We think we can do it in about 65 weeks. So it would be uh, January through like January, or I guess through February of 2015. So I'm excited about that. I love preaching through books of the Bible, and the Book of Acts is really awesome. So that's kind of what's coming up with preaching schedule. I just wanted you guys to kind of have a heads up. I'm excited about these that we've already nailed down that we felt like God is leading us to do. We're still praying through 2014. But it's cool to look that far in advance and have it planned out so we can know where we're going and know what we're going to be studying and not try to pick week to week what we're going to go over. So, all right, moving through just a few things. As far as weekly gathering schedule, we're switching to 10 a.m. on August 5th. And this is, this is what we want to be happening. As these duties that happen every week start to get filled and people start volunteering for these small things that we're going to talk about later, this is the idea of what we would like to happen. At 8.30, from 8.30 to 9 is when, if it's your week to have a responsibility, you would get here, be completely set up with whatever it is, and you'd be done by 9.00. And the reason that we want to do that is because from 9 to 9.30, we want to have this room quiet. And anyone that wants to come early or is already here and has set up, we want to just spend in a time of prayer and just personal, just reading through the Scripture, praying for the gathering, praying for our church, praying for the lost, all these kind of things. And the reason we want to do that is because we want to have a time every week that we as the church can get together and just spend just in prayer for a solid half hour. And this won't be someone up here leading us in prayers or anything like that, but it'll be us just sitting quietly and being able to pray, maybe pray with each other, that kind of stuff. This is also done because we don't want to get in this mindset that we're putting our trust in the fact that we've got everything organized and we've got everything set up right and we're good to go for the worship gathering, that kind of stuff. And we're like, all right, here we go. It's going to work fine because we're set up. But we want to remember and remind ourselves that we plan and we strive and we organize. We try to do all these things well. But if the Holy Spirit doesn't show up, it's pointless. If Jesus isn't working in people's hearts and lives, it, it doesn't matter. So we want to spend that time in prayer, refocusing on, yes, we've set up. Yes, we're organized. Yes, we're ready to go. And we're taking care of what we feel God has called us to do. And now we sit and pray and we are dependent for God to work. And that it's Him working and not us that is going to cause people to be saved, it's going to cause any of us to grow, any of us to go deeper into the gospel. So then from 9.30 to 10 is just pretty much what already goes on, just fellowship, just hanging out, um, getting connected with if new people come in, making sure that we all have this mindset, if someone new or someone you don't know comes in, go to them, introduce yourself. Uh, there's been some new people that have come in the last month or two, and they've been like sitting by themselves. 
This is something we don't really want to happen. I know you guys don't want that to happen. If you were to come for your first time, you probably, maybe you want to sit by yourself, but maybe it would still be nice for someone to invite you. Hey, come sit by me. We've got a lot of open seats. We try to have more than enough out here. So seeking new people, connecting them, introducing them, sit with me, that kind of stuff. And making a connecting point to where you can even talk to them more about what we do here at Ecclesia so they can kind of know what goes on, that we're all about Jesus. Maybe you would from that have an awesome opportunity to share the gospel with them. Maybe you could even start talking to them about religion and the gospel. That's a great way around here because a lot of people understand religion. But they don't really understand the gospel maybe. So that kind of stuff. But fellowship from that time. And then from 10 till about 12 is when we're going to have our worship gathering. So that's what we want to do. We want to get here early, and it's, we want a lot of people to be able to volunteer, so it's not like you're here every week doing something. This would be hopefully every four, five, maybe six weeks, you would have a responsibility to come here and to head up one of these things that we're going to talk about to, that has to happen every week to get ready for the gathering, to get ready to go. So 8.30 to 9, I know it kind of sounds early, but it'll be good. Then we get to spend time in prayer and fellowship, and then we get to worship all together. So that's good stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. A few things that we've, I mean, we pretty much do the same order of worship at our gatherings every week. But a few things that we wanted to add and that we've talked about. Um, I guess just one in particular was we want to, or two, we want to start having two people each week, a guy and a girl, that are volunteering to be prayer counselors is what we call them. So that at the end of the sermon or at the end of the gathering that we can let people know there are people in the back or wherever that are there. If you want to be prayed for, if you need counseling about anything, if you need to talk to someone, we want all of us to be able to switch off and to do that kind of stuff. So it's not the same people every week that are doing that and missing out on singing and things like that, but that would be willing to pray with people, to give people some gospel advice. Um, and this doesn't mean you have to know all the answers. It just means just love on them. A lot of times people need you to listen. A lot of times there might be a problem that you're like, man, we, has, we need to do something about this. Somebody needs help. Uh, week before last on Sunday, uh, a girl came and she was needing to get out of a situation. She was being abused in some way by her boyfriend who was her baby daddy. And so Clay and I got to talk with her and talk through some stuff and she was trying to get out of the situation she had to leave, didn't have any clothes on her back. I mean, ugh. she had clothes on her back, and that's all that she had. She had nothing but the clothes on her back, and $40 in her pocket. She was wearing clothes, I promise. But so what, what happened in that counseling time, we're getting to pray with her and talk with her. It became very evident. We were like, all right, we need to do something. So we said, all right, after this, we're going to go to Walmart, and we're going to get you and your daughter some clothes. We're going to get you some food. We're going to help you get on your way so that you just don't go. She was going to stay with her mom up in Tulsa, but didn't have anything. So we're like, that was a wonderful opportunity for us to use the money that we all give to fuel the mission of the church to put it back and to give it to people that are in need. So stuff like that could come up that you go, we, we as a church really need to help this person. Then you would come to a pastor or someone and say, hey, we want to help do this. What do you think? Yep, that sounds awesome. Let's do it. Um, different stuff like that, but just being there for him, praying. And if something comes up that you're like, whoa, I'm way in over my head, you can come get a pastor and take them back to talk with them as well. A lot of times people just need to pray with someone. Also, we want to add uh, bef before the sermon, this is kind of a cool thing that is a traditional thing that some churches do, and I think it'd be great, that before the sermon, someone, one of the church members, re regular attenders, would come up and read from a mic the text that we're being that is being preached that day that we all get to participate in the open the reading of the word and that if it's your week you're going to know what scripture you have weeks in advance you get to read through that all week you get to figure out you know if there's a word that's kind of hard to pronounce or something figure out how to say it but you get to come up and get to read and someone reads aloud the word of god and that we all participate together in this kind of stuff and so i think that would be cool we're going to try it it's really weird and awkward maybe we won't do it but i think it'd be fun so counseling and then the open reading of the word that's going to be preached through are two big things that we would like to start doing as we worship. All right, so weekly gathering responsibilities. This is stuff that already happens every week, but it's basically two or three of us that get it all done. 
Um, and some of you guys chip in sometimes, and that's great. But we want to make sure that all this kind of stuff, we want we want people to volunteer for it. Hey, I can do that one of the weeks. Hey, I can do that. Hey, I can do that. I can do three or four of these things, actually. And so you could even switch off some. Um, but w- the first thing, chairs, Bibles, pens, info cards, religion versus gospel cards, and the, cl- and the floor. This would be straightening the chairs, making sure every chair has a Bible, an information card, pen, a religion versus the gospel card, and that if the floor needs to be swept, we have a broom and you can just sweep it up. I know it sounds just like, that's not that big of a deal, but that's something that has to happen every week, and we have to find someone to do that every week, or we have to find time to do it. But that can be a big thing that's just straightening up, cleaning up a little bit, and also, or no, that wouldn't include, that's on the next thing. So that would be one of the things. Pretty easy thing that's a big way that you can even get involved and serve. The second thing would be coffee, brewing and setting up the coffee. Uh, we do it right over here. We fill the water in the bathroom, so you carry it back there, carry it in here, get the coffee going. Setting up the communion, the wine, the juice, and the bread. We're about to buy a mini fridge and keep the wine and the juice and then the bread in this room. So you won't have to like go buy it or anything. Someone else will be in charge of making sure it's here. But it's setting up the coffee, getting it brewed, getting it ready to go, um, and then setting out the communion stuff and getting that ready to go. Um, also picking up the donuts on your way. We're going to get a tab down there at Chandler Road Donuts so that we go and get them and then we can pay for them like every month. So you would just go through Chandler Road. They would know which donuts are for Ecclesia. You'd pick them up, bring them here, set up coffee, communion, and then empty the trash if it needs it after we're done, and then make sure that the air is off at the end of gathering, which is just right over here. All this stuff we're talking about, we'll have a training time that we make sure everyone's clear on all the responsibilities. But this is just some of the stuff that we want you guys to know. Um, and then as we put sign-up sheets and stuff like that out for it, you'll have an understanding of, of what, these, what these things are. Sound and lights is something that either Ryan or Kendall have been doing like every week. Kendall's about to go and lead a church plant in Tulsa, so he's not going to be plugged in, and we don't want Ryan to have to do that every week. So it's not really that difficult. It takes a little bit of training to know like what the buttons do, when to unmute stuff, when to mute stuff, that kind of thing. Um, And then also the lights, they're pretty much just some buttons that you change. Button one is the one we use right now like during sermon stuff, and then others you can change during worship. Not really hard stuff, but it's something that we need people to, to volunteer for so that's not the same person doing it every week. As far as slides, Carter does it every week, and we love it, and we thank you for doing that, but we, wanna, we don't want you to have to do that every week. Because during the sermon, I imagine it's not too big of a deal, but when you're singing and when, when you're wanting to praise and worship, but then you've got to remember to keep pushing the buttons at the right time. It's difficult, so we want to all pitch in on that. Again, that's something that's really not that hard. You just kind of got to learn and get in a rhythm. Carter's in a good rhythm. He does an awesome job at it. So he can do a good job at showing you guys, if any of you are interested in serving in that way, show you how to do it. It's not too hard at all. Just a few things you got to remember. As far as serving in the children, we have quite a few people that are signed up, but we need more. It's been about... uh, once a month or once every five weeks that the same people are having to be in there and hopefully we can get some more people to volunteer and to be faithful to do it and not not show up on their week things like that but if you're interested in volunteering to help out in Ecclesia Kids uh, we'll have a sign up sheet for that too Tristan just commented on the Ecclesia Facebook saying who is willing and able to do this is there anyone else so if you are and you haven't signed up yet Go check that out and go let her know. Tristan is heading up the Ecclesia Kids stuff right now. So, all right, prayer counselors, we already talked about that. And we'll have some training for each of these things, small training just to let you know, make sure you feel good, answer questions, all that kind of stuff. And then sermon scripture reader, we already talked about that. If you're like, hey, I can't read well in front of people. I do not want to do that. It's cool. But if you feel like that would be cool, I would love to come and do that. I'd love to serve in that kind of way as a part of the worship gathering. Uh, we'll have sign up for that. You can let us know. Also, uh, number eight, a community group connector. What we want, what we're going to do soon is set up a little table in here somewhere, have a little banner that says community groups, so that when people, if someone comes that's new, we always tell them, we'd love to get you plugged into a community group. We want to get you plugged in. Right now, I just go, uh, just talk to someone else, because most everyone else is in community groups, so talk to them to help you get plugged in. We want a better way to get people plugged in and someone that can be there and that if a new person comes, they're interested in community groups, we'll have handouts, we'll have stuff you can give them, and you can talk to them about what they are, and if they're like, hey, I want to check out one, I want to get involved, 
you can know which group to plug them into and then you can get them in contact with the community group leader and they can take it from there. So it's basically just being someone that that week you're in charge of being at the table and that we can send people to you so that they can effectively get connected to getting into a community group. This is a big part of what we do as a church, being involved in community. And that church is not an event. It's nothing like that, but it's living life together. It's gathering together to worship Jesus. It's scattering into our lives and then gathering in smaller groups um, to stay on mission. So that's some of the stuff. Um, also, so we have some lead beacons needed. There are nine things that we want people to, to pray through to think through and to just consider committing to doing this maybe for a year, maybe for six months. Maybe you say, man, can I try it out for three months? I don't know if this would be good or not. But these are, these are some things that are more like leading an area and having other people that have volunteered for certain things sort of under you and you're doing the organizing and you're making sure that everything's kind of taken care of. Some of these things, yeah, you will be doing stuff, but some of them will simply be you're going to make sure that everyone knows what they're doing and they're doing their job. And that's your job is just kind of overseeing an area. So the first thing is librarian. I think Jenny is um, wanting to head this up. This is essentially just ordering books. When we get low on certain books, I'm the one that does that now. That I have to keep an eye on if we get low on Bibles or study Bibles or certain books that I have to go and look and order them and all that stuff. So we want someone to head it up. Also to develop a system that um, you can buy something like a $10 little card and that you can come and get a book from there whenever you want. You can take it with you, and then you can bring the book back and then get another book. And if you lose the book, you'll just have to buy a new little card. So it basically makes it to where you can't just keep borrowing and taking books and keep coming back and go, whoops, I lost them, but can I get another one for free? But So it's almost working like a library for those of us who don't maybe have a lot of money and we don't want to pour a bunch of money into buying books, but you can still get books and read it. So. We want someone to be over that. We need someone to be over the accountant and the financial records. This is taking in the offerings, making the deposits, that kind of stuff. This is someone that we'll, uh, we will have to know well, and we'll go through a process of making sure um, that they are qualified to do this, um, that they're a good steward of the money that God has given them, um, and that they are not in it to try to control and try to do different things like that. So. But that is something if you feel, hey, I'd be good at that, and I, I would like to serve in that way, let us know all these things. Love Muskogee Director. We want to continue to reach out to our community in word and deed and continue to work in the parks um, and even get in with some of the schools on how we can mentor children, things like that. We really, really need someone to be the director and be the overseer of that area that is looking at, okay, this is the date that we're going to do something. We're going to go back, like right now, we need to go back to Beckman Park. We got to work there, but there's a whole lot of work left to do. Um, we would like someone to be over that, set a date, organize everything. This is what we need. This is what time we're going to be there. Figure out drinks and getting drinks and water and that kind of stuff there. Equipment, all that kind of stuff. But they would be in charge of the months to months Love Muskogee things of how we reach out and we serve in our community and even get creative that's it doesn't have to be parks it doesn't just have to be mentoring but how can we best serve and love our city and seek the good of our city so we're looking for someone to just take all of these things essentially and take off with them and get creative and to because right now we're doing all of these things and we're trying to do them the best that we can but a lot of them are just as good as we can do it right now but we want one person to be able to focus on leading out and pushing forward these kind of ministries Number four is a media director. This will be someone that keeps up to date the website, the artwork that we use, and different kind of designs. Even stuff that we like put on stage, even stuff that you know we put on walls or the kids room, all that kind of stuff. Um, I do probably 15 or so hours a week work right now keeping the website up, putting the new sermons up, getting the community group stuff up, all that kind of stuff, posting new blogs, making artwork. And so it would be very beneficial for someone to head that up. And also, all of these are kind of like, if you feel, I don't feel like I could really lead that. I don't feel like I'm really able to do that. But I, if someone is going to lead it, and I could be like their right-hand man and be their go-to guy for the other kind of stuff, if you're thinking that, that's great. Let us know. Because um, you don't necessarily have to be some crazy leader in it, but to serve. So if you feel like you'd be a good right-hand man or a good help in any of these areas, uh, let us know. Number five, a worship director. 
Um, this is someone that basically guards on the songs that we do. Make sure we don't do stupid songs that say stupid things that aren't in the Bible and that don't make sense. Um, helps us learn new songs. Helps us be organized. Right now, Blake and Bo are leading worship and they alternate. Blake's about to go and help plant the church in Tulsa. So for right now, it's going to be Bo is the only one that we have. If some of you other guys um, want to jump in on that and help lead worship, that's great. And we want someone to be able to head it up and learn, teach new songs and really work and push forward the worship ministry that we have on Sunday mornings when we all worship through song. Number six, worship gathering director. And what this would be is all those things that we talked about that happen every, <coughs> that happen every week. Um, and even the preaching and even the leading of worship, all this kind of stuff. This would be someone that is kind of over it all making sure that everything is taken care of for that week as far as they know who's supposed to be doing what the upcoming Sunday, and maybe on Monday they would get in contact with everyone, make sure, hey, you're doing this, just make sure you're good to do it, you're responsible for it, we're not going to keep wiping your nose, I'm not going to call you every day reminding you, stuff like that, but being over and being organized, and this would be even so that I could call this person and say, hey, on Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, somewhere and say, hey, we good to go for Sunday, do we need to fill any holes? Like, nope, we're good to go. And everything's good and responsibility is delegated and everything moves well. And this frees pastors up. This frees me up to do a lot more ministering to people, a lot more reading and writing and studying and praying to where I get really tied up doing some smaller things uh, right now. So I'm pumped about that um, because I think that would be good just to make sure. Because right now that's me. I make sure that everything's good to go. And I'm not able to do it really well because I'm doing a hundred other things at the same time. So I'd love for someone to lead out in that way and just kind of organize and make sure everyone knows what they're doing. So number seven, Ecclesia Kids Director. This is what Tristan is doing right now. Um, she's pretty overloaded I think right now because her two new kids that they just got like a week and a half ago. But I know she's wanting to continue to do that. So be praying for her. Maybe some of you contact Tristan and say, hey, what can I do to help right now? Because she's in a really transition, crazy transition part of her life. Say, what needs to be done in the kids area? What do you need help with? I'd love to help you with that right now. Number eight, community groups director. This would also be someone that contacts the community group leaders. Make sure, just checks up on the groups. How's your group doing? Who's coming? Who's falling off? Who's not really coming? Why are they not coming? Have you reached out to them? Have you talked to them? Is there a problem going on with them and someone else in the group? Do we need to make a change? Um, how can we best kind of chase after them to let them know we love them, we want you to be in community, you need to be in community, you need to be involved, that kind of stuff. And really so it's not a pastor doing all this little stuff, but it's someone that's overseeing the community groups. And if there's a big problem or if there's a big prayer request, something that's come up, they can then contact the pastor. And if something really action needs to be taken that's big action, they can contact the people accordingly and we can just keep shepherding people well. That's the idea of all of this, that we would be good stewards of what we're doing, that we would do everything that we're doing, we'd do it well, we'd be organized and we wouldn't be running around like chickens with their heads cut off, but that we would be shepherding the whole flock well and that people, everyone would be taken care of. And if someone's kind of straying in some sense, that we would go after them as Jesus has gone after us. We would love them and we would build them up, and we would strengthen them. So, Number nine, discipleship groups director. Oh, oh sorry, uh, number eight, one other thing. that we want About every two months, we have the idea that we want to have like all the community groups get together for one big joint community group. This has happened every two or three months um, in the last like seven or eight, I think. Uh, but we want to make sure that that happens and that we know when that's going to happen. So the community group director would also do that, that they would look in the future and say, okay, this week... Just plan on this. We're all going to get together, have one big joint community group. We're going to have food, and they get all that stuff organized, know what we need, and then we let the church know this is what we're doing. This is coming up, so you know you can plan accordingly. Number nine, discipleship groups director. We, we want to be continually moving through different discipleship groups, and this is stuff that you, most of you guys have been involved in before, whether we go through a book like The Prodigal God, um, we're about to start a new one this fall called Why We Believe the Bible. It's a really awesome one that I've been through before, and it's great stuff. We're going to do another Prodigal God this fall for those of you who maybe haven't been involved in that yet. We want everyone that's a part of the church to go through the Prodigal God study series because it's 
essential to really understanding in a deep way the grace of God in the gospel. And I know for all of us that have gone through it, for me personally, that it was a great, a great deal of growth just continues to happen from that study. So this would be um, getting people to lead this kind of stuff. Say, okay, and just organizing. This is when we're going to start. This is how many weeks it's going to last. This is who's leading it, all that kind of stuff. But staying on top of it and staying on top of, okay, when we get done with these, this is when we're going to start other groups. And so that it just doesn't get done with one and then we look, okay, well, when are we going to start the next? But we want to be planned out in everything that we do as best as we can. So I think... Yep, that's all. And then the smaller stuff, those are like the big leading areas of like people leading these big ideas. And then the smaller stuff, just serving. This will be set up for gathering, like that stuff we talked about earlier, the chairs stuff. Coffee, communion for gatherings. Sound and lights for gatherings. Slides for gatherings. Worship leaders. If you play an instrument or if you sing or if you want to get involved in leading the church and worship on Sundays when we gather, awesome. Ecclesia Kids volunteers, we need those. Prayer counselors for gatherings. We need those as well. So this is some stuff that we've already kind of talked through, but don't be scared and be like, well, I can't like lead out or oversee something. I'm not going to do that well. That's okay. You can, all of us can still volunteer on these smaller levels. We can all fill in. We can all do this kind of stuff. So I'm pumped about this stuff because it's a lot of stuff that already happens and we're kind of maxed out for what we can actually do right now and keep doing. But we don't ever want to get to that point. We don't want to get to the point that it's like, well, there's about 50 people that we can have involved in the church total that we can disciple. We don't want to be there. We want to reach more, and we want to be able to effectively disciple more. And as we do this kind of stuff, we'll continually train new people that come and that get involved to do this kind of stuff so that we can all be serving and we can all pitch in. A few things to end. Oh, Nope, we got three more. <coughs> Excuse me. We need more community group leaders. We flat out, we're always going to need to plant new community groups. So if you've been a Christian a while, if you feel, hey, I've been a part of a community group a while and I feel like I could start a new group. I feel like I could effectively lead and shepherd a group. That's great. Come talk to us. We want to plant more community groups. We want community groups to be everywhere. Right now we're looking at planning one in the Shakota area because there's 15 plus people that live in Shakota that we would like for them to not have to drive all the way to Muskogee twice a week to worship and to go to community. So be mindful of that. Maybe you're not at the point right now to where you can effectively lead a community group. But be thinking, I want to get there. I want to be there. I would love to lead out. I would love to. This is where discipleship really, really happens. Mark Driscoll was posting some stuff about leading a community group. That's the same thing that they call them at their church, their small groups. He said one of the cool things about leading a community group is that the kingdom of God shows up on your couch. And it's so cool. And as, as you'll see, as those of you who've been a part of community and seen a lot of growth from being in community like I have, it's crazy that you see yourself and other people just continually grow as we gather together in smaller groups to pray together for each other, to study the Bible, to share meals, you just see Jesus changing people more and more and Jesus getting higher and higher in people's lives and then prizing and praising Him more and more. You see sin starting to look stupider and stupider. So that's good stuff. Um, we need community group connectors for gatherings like we had talked about. Someone to volunteer, hey, I'd love to be back there so someone could come talk and I'll get them plugged into a group. And then we also need discipleship group leaders for when we start new groups. We want to continually, I think the prodigal God, <coughs> excuse me, and why we believe the Bible will probably be two that we're going to continually do throughout the life of Ecclesia because they're two very important things. Really understanding what the Bible is, why we believe it, and then really understanding the depths of the gospel. So these are going to be things as new people get connected already. At, at one point, almost everyone in Ecclesia had gone through the prodigal God series and we we're like, sweet. And now there's tons of people that have never been through it because a lot of new people have, have got connected. So that's great. But we're going to continually, we're not going to all go through the prodigal God every time. That would get a little bit old. So we're going to keep going through new stuff. And as well as the new people that get connected are going to keep going through what we've already gone through. And it's this big discipleship process. And it's also that people would come to see Jesus more clearly and come to love Jesus more fully 
and come to serve Jesus more fully and in a more committed way. So that's the point of all of it. We have a lot of needs. There's a lot of... uh, I'm excited about a lot of this because there's a lot of sweet stuff that as we all start serving and really being on mission and having this vision, this is what we're doing. This is what we need. This is how I can serve my church well. That we're going to see more and more people come to Jesus. We're going to see more and more people grow in Jesus. And that's good stuff. And I'm excited about it all. All right, so I have a... Just a challenge for all of you. I mean, obviously you want to be serving in some way at your church. One way that you can start doing this, and this is what everyone, I would suggest everyone do this. Start meeting weekly with a person of the same sex to disciple them. If you've been walking with Jesus for some time, if you understand the gospel and you're not still constantly asking questions, what the heck does all this mean? If you feel like you're there, meet with someone that's not as far along as you yet meet with them to love them to pray with them to share a meal together to go through a book together and discuss stuff um those of you who are like i don't really know if i'm at that point to disciple someone get find someone that is further along in their sanctification than you go to them and say disciple me i want to meet with you once a week let's get together i need someone to help me and love me and lead me and to disciple me so Let's all do this. If you feel like, I don't feel like I'm ready to disciple someone. Okay, then go find someone and be discipled. That's as simple as we can put it. This is what it's going to look like for us to keep making disciples. That Not just a few of us doing it. Like Kendall said, even Sunday. It's like If we're expecting the three pastors, the leaders, to be discipling everyone, it won't work. As he talked about, Jesus had this close-knit three, Peter, James, and John, that he really, really discipled. He poured into a lot of people but his close personal relationships were those three. So let's say just start with one. Start meeting with someone. Some of you guys are to the point to where you get the gospel, you understand what it's about, you understand who Jesus is, why he died, why he lived, why he arose, and you understand what it looks like to be on mission for Jesus. And if you're there, start meeting with someone, praying for them, praying with them, answering them, answering questions that they have. Asking them tough questions about their life, about what they think about certain things, and just start growing. You'll find that you grow a lot too when you start discipling someone because you'll be challenged. So go through a book of the Bible, go through a book together, all that kind of stuff. But start meeting with someone. Go to someone if you don't feel like you can disciple. And if you feel like you can, go and find somebody and say, hey, let's get together, let's do this. So let's stay on mission as a church. What else? What can we do better or start doing to better reach the lost and disciple the saved in Muskogee and the surrounding areas? I want some feedback. What do you guys think? Huh? <laughs> I mean, anyone have any ideas? Anyone think things a lot? It's like, man, I really think if we focused more on this as a church that this would be good or I really think we neglect this area or this isn't like anyone's going to be offended this is a time for you as members as regular attenders as a part of Ecclesia to say I think this is what we can do throw an idea out there Hmm. Cool. That's true. Yep. 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 I like it. Mm hmm. Sweet. So maybe doing like when we do our big community group stuff, doing it in more of a public place. Why not? Yeah. Making t-shirts for it. (laughs) Every two months. Do what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. 
The idea of community groups is that we would always be inviting people to get plugged in. If you're, if you want to invite someone to get plugged in to Ecclesia in any way, invite them to community group before you even invite them to worship gathering. Worship gatherings are really first and foremost for believers. I mean, non-believers are completely welcome always to come, but that's the time of the week that we get together to worship, to receive preaching and teaching, that kind of stuff, to take communion, all this kind of stuff. And it's really first and foremost for Christians, for us, to be strengthened so that we would all be edified and we would be equipped for ministry. You know, But non-believers are always welcome, and you're welcome to invite them to that. But if you want people to get connected to the church, invite them to community groups because that's really where people get to know someone and they don't just come and sit and you know think that church is some kind of event but they can get to know people so be mindful too that if someone new comes to your community group reach out to them it may be awkward but give them your number say hey this is my name this is my number i want to be friends help people get connected and know that like we all feel we want them to love jesus we want them to meet jesus and if they already have we want them to grow in jesus but let them know that, hey, we love you. You're not a number. You're not a statistic that, yay, we have 12 coming to our community group, or yay, we had 30 in our worship gathering. Who cares? We care about people. If numbers grow, that's great, but we want it to be because it's people and not just numbers. You get that? So invite people to get connected to your group. Um, we have a lot of groups that are smaller. Ours is pretty small right now. Carter's and Nate and Jenny's is pretty small right now. We've had people leave. Our group's new. So there's a lot of opportunity to get people planted into new groups. Ryan and Age's group is pretty big right now and, and can't really get that much bigger and still be extremely effective. So there are other groups that are smaller that we want to get people plugged into. So keep doing that. But by all means, don't stop inviting people to your community group because it's getting big. Never do that. We can always plant new groups and get people connected in more. So. Again, we need more community group leaders. We need people to step up and say, I can do this. What's the vision? What do we really need to make sure that we're doing? I want to be on mission. I want to do this. Let us know. And then we can work towards planning more and more and more. What else? I think we've already started it with, with the, you know, like the blog party, but I think that it's just not me. But uh, I think we should focus definitely on, like, you know, what is the problem in our town or whatever. Like, you know, let's go, let's go to AA or something. For sure. I think it's Christian based. Like, my mom goes there and stuff, and I, I've been there, and it's just like ridiculous. Yeah, but I mean, like. AA is, in general, is not really Christian based. It's just like it's spirituality idea, based. Yeah, yeah, but there's a lot of the, like, admitting there is a God type stuff. Yeah. But some of them are tweaked to be like mm-hmm. Christian. I mean, I don't want to like boot it up or, you know, you know like set up a boot or anything. You should definitely reach out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Cool. Mm-hmm. It's switching now. It's not what it used to be. No. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it used to be back in the day. It was an orphanage back in the day. And then it was a homeless shelter for a while, and now it's turning into something else. Peggy sold it. That was where Robert Cook used to stay. But, but yeah, a lot of this kind of stuff is great to do just as a Christian. Just to go and do it. Um, not everything that we do in our lives as far as like serving and getting out of the community needs to be like this huge church group that's doing something, you know? Like, if we want to serve at these different places, yeah, great, go do it. And get other people to come and do it. And say, hey, this is what's going on. This is a cool way to serve. Um, what gets weird is that some people don't do anything as far as serving and reaching out to people and loving people, sharing the gospel or anything, unless it's like this church event type thing doing it. And that's sad because then a lot of churches try to make sure that they have a million programs that are doing all of these things so that people in their churches will actually be doing them. But really, there's a lot of stuff that we're just called to do as Christians, as people, that you know we we can't just always do as a huge church group. You know, church groups try to go to gospel rescue mission a lot, and really, a lot of the times, what they end up doing 
is work that the people at the Gospel Rescue Mission can do and would do, but they let a church come do it because churches want to go there and feel good that they actually did something. Like one of the last churches that went in there asked Rob what they were doing. He said they were painting a wall. I was like, do you think that like the people that are staying for free at the Gospel Rescue Mission, they could like they could do that, you know? He's like, well, yeah. He's like, then why, I wonder, why don't they do it? He said, I don't know, the church just wanted to come and do it. Like, yeah, I get that, but that's not really serving. If it's doing something simple that's just like filling time to go, yay, we served. It's like, we need to look for stuff to do that's like no one else is doing or no one else can do or no one else will do, that kind of stuff. Um, but all that stuff is good, and we do want to be a part of that. And as we see need to, as the church, really go and do that kind of stuff, that's great. As the organizational sense of the church. I just remember, we're always the church. We are the body of Christ when we're in our lives. So some of that, some of the stuff that we see. Maybe you see some stuff that would be like, hey, if we mobilized a huge group to do something about this, this would be great. If you see something like that, come and tell us. Because we want to do that kind of stuff. Like Beckman Park, that's not something that one of us would just go, I'm just going to go and redo that whole park. That's something that's good. It's like, hey, let's get the church together and let's go love Muskogee um, because that would be impossible and you'd probably be suicidal by the time you got done if you're trying to do it by yourself. So that kind of stuff. Have you guys seen anything in the city that's like, if we really mobilized and really got out and got to work, we could do something about this? I don't, I don't, yeah, it's true, you can, all right, what else, what can we do to better, what can we do better or start doing to be better, to better reach the lost disciples saved, some of this could be like the church organization sense needs to do something, some of this could just be in our personal lives, we need to do this. Mm-hmm. Right. Sweet. It's really new people really getting connected with them. Like it. Mm-hmm. Right. True. So everyone keeping their eyes open to new people. They're here for some reason. They're searching or looking for something. Might as well give them Jesus. Lance, do you have your hand up? <laughs> right. Definitely not. Right. Right. No. Mm-hmm. Right. And this is, I think, where the rubber meets the road on us being Christians, on us being the body. That there doesn't necessarily need to be some person as far as like doing that, but it needs to be you. It needs to be all of us. That we meet someone we see out and then we get connected with him, we get his number and we talk to him and we keep talking to him, you know, and stay in contact. Like Brittany was saying, like go after those new people that come, go invite them to lunch and even say, hey, I'll pay for you. Because a lot of people are like, no, we're going to go home and eat because it might be because they don't really have money to go eat. But you can take them to lunch, you can pay for their meal and I know it would be such a big dent in your wallet. 
But we can do that kind of stuff and connect with people and remember people. But this, I think if we get too organized in the sense of there's someone leading a church program for all this kind of stuff, then everyone just kind of turns their brains off and says, oh, a new person was there. But yeah, someone else is in charge of contacting them. That needs to be us. That needs to be you. I mean, if someone fills out an information card, we always contact them and talk to them. Um, but that's one of the things that we all need to be about constantly. Someone new, say, hey. I mean, essentially, it's almost like you're adopting them as a friend that you want to start. Okay, I'm the person. I'm definitely chasing after them because I want to be their friend. And I want them to know they're loved and accepted here. And uh, if they're in Christ, I want them to get plugged in to be discipled. And if they're not, I want to get the gospel to them so that they can hear about how awesome Jesus is. So, really, that's a great question, and it just needs to be the church. The church needs to do it. Keep looking out for new people. Stay in contact with them. Give people your number. Get their number. Contact them throughout the week. All that kind of stuff. But we can't expect any few people to do that for everyone. We just all need to have this missional mindset that we're always seeking the glory of Christ and everything that we're doing and that we always want to love people like Jesus has loved us. I always just remember how it was when you first started coming even to church. When you first started, it's weird. You don't know that many people and you're like, well, here we go. I'm just going to go. And how nice it was that in some way or another, someone reached out to you and helped you kind of stay connected and helped know that, hey, hey, we want you here. You're welcome here. Jesus loves you. I love you. All that kind of stuff. Just remember how that feels when you're coming into a place that's new and it's scary for a lot of people. It takes a lot of guts for some people just to come to a church gathering that they don't even want to come in. We have people all the time that I invite and then we talk to about the church. They're like, so is it, is it like really judgmental? It's like, no. It's like, what do you wear there? It's like, I just wear jeans and a shirt and I'm up on stage preaching. It's like, really not that big of a deal. But a lot of people have this tainted view of church and that they think it's this judgmental, legalistic, Pharisee people walking around trying to push religion on everyone. But we just want people to meet Jesus. So, but yeah. What do you think about that, Lance? About. about that, like, that's our job to do, like, everyone's job to do that. No, yeah, I agree. I totally agree. I mean, I was just, I said, no, there was, other than those cars, there's a way we do. Because there's a lot of times where I, I just know the people that I see here in this room that I come in. If someone moves here, it's going to slip through my, my fingers, or I don't notice that they might be here or something like that. I didn't know if there was a, you know what I mean? If I just come in and say, hey, who, who, who would move? Yeah. You know what I mean? You yeah, 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 yeah. Right. That'd be fine. I like bread. <laughs> well, it could be cool, like you're talking about. If someone does come that's new and we, they fill out a card and we get that, it could be cool to have someone or a couple. If it's a couple that comes, have another couple reach just contact them let them know hey we're glad you came hey do you guys want to come over for dinner sometime I think that, yeah that would be actually cool but not at the not since we know someone kind of does that then we all just kind of go oh someone else does that not to defeat that whole yeah don't don't turn your brain off to that thing because someone else is doing it I don't care if it would work well and if it would help people get connected, that'd be great. I don't care. <laughs> That's another thing. Go introduce yourself to people. There's like fifty there's like fifty of us that are involved. I would not be opposed to doing little name tags. I don't care. A lot of churches do that still, that every week they just have name tags on so people know who each other are. And so it's not awkward that it's like, I know that person. I've talked to him before. I see him every week and I have no idea what their name is. Cards huh? Cards, that? cards what? Yeah, name tags. Yeah. Oh, like business cards? We can get cool Chase, design us some cool little hip name tags. So we don't look weird. 
Yes. They have to have lights on them, though. <laughs> like where your head's at. <laughs> this already is a cult. This guy's new. You can't throw that hit at him. <laughs> We're not a cult. Drink up. Well, what else? Anything else you guys think of? What what are we doing that we can be doing better? I mean, that would be something that's like, hey, we're moving there, and just mention that for right now. Well, to me, yeah. Or someone just say, hey. Or like you did to Ryan, you were asking Ryan about it. It would just be something that the, the community group leader up there would probably, it'd be nice to give them a heads up that you were coming. I mean, yeah, yeah. But it's not like a taboo of like, oh no. We like to keep, we, we try to do, as far as community groups in Muskogee, we try to keep from hopping around to different ones for the sake of um, being like, um, I'm kind of, I don't feel like going on tonight. I'll just go to Brett's group tomorrow night. Yeah. Um, and that's just dumb because community groups are supposed to be like this. Essentially, the idea is that's your immediate family in the church. And then on Sundays when we all gather together, that's like your cousins and your aunts and uncles that you love and that you worship together, all that kind of stuff. But you're not able to connect with all of the people in the local church in the way that you connect with your immediate family in community groups. And that's the purpose of it, is that we would all have this immediate family that we love, that we're honest with, that we get to really invest in, and that we're on mission with. So, Yeah, I have. I try to. But yeah. I've been moving around like different community groups, and I kind of like that because I agree with all the different people. Right. Relationships with all of them. Mm -hmm. That'd be something like, you know, all of us just going to switch out. It's possible, but <laughs> yeah, and we've talked about it before and par prayed through it too, but the the mission, the idea with community groups is that the community group you're a part of now has like, I don't know, like 13 people involved in it. And the idea is that once it gets that big, that another person or two in that group or in another group would take some people from that group and go plan another one. And that it would keep, we'd keep planning more groups and not just... Because if we just hop around all the time, we're not really going to be on mission to reach out to new people. It's just going to be, well, I'm in this new group, so now i got to get to know all these people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like Brittany said, that's the purpose of when we get chase all the groups together so that it's like we all get to. And Sunday gatherings, stuff like that. No, it's good. But that's, that's just the reason that we say we don't want to do that because we want to make sure that we stay on mission to... That we want to keep reaching out to people, and so okay, well, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, well, a few of it was we planted a new group, and then him and Danielle went to another one, so that Danielle wasn't in a group that her, it was her high school teacher because that was weird. Or teachers. Yeah, teachers, Jenny and Nate. 
kind of awkward. But I mean, it is. I can't imagine. That'd have been like my mom teaching my community group. She is my teacher. <laughs> Homeschool joke. Worship night? Yeah, that was awesome idea for me. Like, it's not only what we reached out to other Christians and churches, it was like, it was, I think that was fun. Yeah. 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 And that might be something that we start doing here from time to time, like every few months. Um, yeah. It just basically, it was three of us that were leading it, and we all got really busy, and we're, we weren't able to keep doing it well. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of weird because it was tied to the BCM, which really kind of narrows down your scope because it narrows it down to Baptists that are in college. It's like we never really wanted it to be like that. We wanted it to be like anyone and everyone. But it was good times. But would like to do something like that. Something that we're going to start doing and that I really want to start doing, and a few of you guys might be pumped. Some of you guys might think it sounds real stupid. Um, but we're going to do it anyways. We're going to do stuff like a Friday night for two or three hours and then like six or seven hours on Saturday. We're going to offer like intensive discipleship studies, like going through things like huge ideas, like going through the doctrines of grace on a Friday night and then a Saturday. It's almost like a mini conference. They come for a few hours, you go home and rest, and then all day Saturday you come and we even have little breakout things where you get to discuss what we've been learning with people. Um but all that kind of stuff. I'm pumped about that stuff because I think it's good. And so that's going to be kind of a new thing that we're adding as well to do discipleship. I want to do this thing that's called Secret Church. Some of you guys may have heard of it. But it's something that David Platt's church uh, started doing a few years ago. And they get together on a Friday night at 6 p.m. And they go from 6 p.m. till midnight. And Platt, this dude who's got his doctorate in like three different things, is an amazing Bible teacher. He will teach on a topic for those like, I think it's like four and a half straight hours. You have some breaks, you have some breaks in between, but it's four and a half total hours of teaching. And like one of the first ones he did, he taught through the meaning of the entire Old Testament to help you understand the Old Testament and what it's talking about and how it's pointing to Jesus. Then one he did the cross and suffering for like four and a half hours of this dude who's an amazing Bible teacher. One he took... Uh, money and possessions and what the Bible says about that, like in every instance, what it says and studying through that. So I love doing that kind of stuff um, because I'd like to get it all done at once and have this intense time of really studying, having this big view of what the Bible says. So that stuff's called Secret Church. It was birthed out of this dude went to India to train pastors and they had, some of them were like underground pastors and they had to come to this room and they would come for like 12 hours a day and he would just teach and train these pastors for 12 solid hours and these guys could not get enough of it. And they had to like share Bibles because they didn't have enough and all this kind of stuff. But he said, man, what would it look like if we actually did that? If we really set aside like six hours in the States on a Friday night and it just blew up and they do it every, I think, three months and they've done it for years now. And it's a huge thing. You have to even buy tickets to go to it now because so many people from all across the nation want to keep going to it. But dude's a good Bible teacher. and It's called Secret Church. It's a cool thing. And it, they focus on praying for uh, people groups that have not yet been reached with the gospel too uh, throughout that time. So, and they put all of the... Like you have a study guide that you go through while he's teaching, so you're interacting with it as well. And he, they put the videos of the teaching and everything up for free. So we can get access to any of those that we would want to go through. So I'm going to start doing stuff like that and then doing those intensive like discipleship courses on weekends. So I'm excited about that stuff. Were you going to say something before I started that? Sure. Okay. Anybody else? Cool. I'm going to pray and then... <coughs> Sorry. Um, if any of these things that we mentioned jumped out at you, any of these more the the lead things or the directors of certain things, they kind of jumped out at you, hey, I'm interested in this, can we talk more about it, or I feel like I'd be good at that, 
come let me know tonight. Let's start talking about it, and we can get together and talk through some of this stuff. Um, and then this other kind of stuff, as far as the small things that we need that are still big helps and a great way to serve, um, we'll have some sign-up sheets up for those at gatherings, and also you'll be able to sign up online. So just keep looking at the Ecclesia Facebook. Look at that constantly. I want to encourage you all to do that. People are always posting prayer requests, questions, um, needs, different kind of things like that. So stay looking at that. You can actually go to it and turn on the top right, turn notifications on for that. So when someone posts in it and has a prayer request or anything like that, you'll actually get a notification about it. So make sure that's on so that you stay in contact with the church. You know what's going on and you can pray for people when they ask for it. One of the things that a lot of people do, honestly, no one goes and checks it unless they have a prayer request. Unless they have something that they want or they need, they don't really go to it or don't really care what other people post. So that's sad. Shouldn't be like that. So let's all make sure that we go and check it and that we're not just seeking our good, but we're seeking the good of everybody. So I'm going to pray and then come and talk to me if any of those things jumped out at you or you'd like to serve. Father God, we thank you so much for this time. Thank you that we get to we get to really get on mission and get more organized as your church, Ecclesia. We thank you, Jesus, for planting this church, for appointing us pastors to lead. We thank you for, for all of us that are involved, that we get to be on mission together, that we get to worship together, we get to be in community together. We are so thankful that you've reconciled us, Jesus, that you've reconciled us to God, but you've also reconciled us to each other. Now we have these things in common, that we have you in common, that before we wouldn't have really hung out for any reason, but because you love us and we love you, you've reconciled us and we're a family. We're just thankful for that, the gift that the church is. Help us to serve and to use the gifts that you've given us in a way that glorifies you, and that we serve by the strength that you give us, and we speak by the words that you give us. Help everything to be in your name and to be all about you, Jesus. And it's in your good name we pray. Amen. 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 Pray. Amen.